Today, we're going to talk about what the cost of following Jesus actually is. And we're going to come from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And he continues, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. In this part of Luke, he's talking about the cost of discipleship. And I want to start in the business world because I think that's where some of us will be most familiar. At my job as a senior business analyst, what I do is I analyze our business and where we need to go. And then I make an analysis of what it will cost to get us where we need to go using certain products or certain vendors, software, whatever it may be. And then I present that to management and they make a decision on whether we should go with this or not. We're doing a cost benefit analysis. According to this definition, it is a systematic process of evaluating the desirability of a decision by weighing its potential benefits and costs. We're looking at multiple things. We're saying, I need to get the business to go to this particular place, and here's what it would cost to get it there using this particular avenue. And it can be complex because I've got different vendors that I can choose from, and they offer different levels of service, and they offer different cost models as well. So to get a really good level of service, you might have to pay more, but it may not get you where you need to be in the end. So there's questionability about the whole process. In other words, I don't always know from my cost benefit analysis if what I think we can do for the company will actually happen a year or two later. So there's some guesswork there. Well, think about that cost benefit analysis. And I want you to think about what Jesus is really presenting the world with in these verses. He's literally saying, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then he goes into a breakdown of what happens if you choose him and if you don't. But before we get into that cost-benefit analysis, I want to throw a few ideas out here about what he's saying and what he's not saying. The first thing I would say is, if anyone would come after me, and then jump to the end there of verse 23, follow me. If you're going to come after Jesus, you've got to follow him. What that means is everybody that hears the voice of Jesus in the scriptures has to make a decision. Are you going to follow Jesus and do what he says, or are you just going to kind of tag along with the group? Are you going to sit in the church pew? Or are you actually going to get saved? Are you going to sit there and entertain the idea of Christianity, or will you actually fulfill the mission of God and let God's will be lived out in your life? That is the decision that he's asking us to make right here. And how does he ask us to make that decision? He says there's a difference between just tagging along in the many groups that were walking with him in that day, because you remember there was many people walking with him, and as he began to teach harder and harder truths, people began to drop off left and right. Jesus is interested in walking with the people that want to walk with him in truth for who he really is. He doesn't want this superficial relationship. He never has. And the Gospels bear that out. Walking with Jesus versus following him means following him involves denying that person's own will, their own desires, so that they can be replaced with God's desires and God's will as God originally intended it in the beginning. That's hard because now we have to say, if I don't do these things that the world says are pleasurable, if I do not pursue these things that the world says are safe for myself and I pursue God instead, will I actually get life? Will I actually get what I'm supposed to get? Will I actually have a better existence following God than not following God and following this world and its pattern of self-preservation, 
protecting yourself at the cost of all else, looking out for number one. He says you've also got to take up your cross daily and follow him. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions here about that. So here's a picture of a cross. It's a piece of jewelry. Think about what this means. What are people trying to say when they wear a cross? In many cases, for some, it's just a piece of jewelry. And for others, it means something more. It means I'm a follower and a believer in Jesus. I'm a Christian. And that's what they use to symbolize that. But it's a strange way to symbolize that because there's more to a cross than just a piece of gold jewelry to make yourself look good or to represent your faith. The Romans were known to have perfected crucifixion, creating the most intense pain possible for the victim, displaying them on a pole up high so that everybody could see if you disrespect Roman authority, you will pay. And this is how. It's important to note that the cross as an instrument of death meant pain and suffering. So while you're not standing on a platform, while you're hanging on the cross, you're standing on a slanted platform. So you're, you're sliding off, but there's nails in your feet and you've got nails in your hands. So you're pushing with your feet, but you're sliding off. So you need your hands to help support yourself, but you're pulling on your own flesh and ligaments, trying to hold yourself up. A cross is an instrument of pain, suffering, death, and in a sense, shame in the world because criminals were shamed. This is what Jesus went through. And this is the symbol behind his words for the cross. These are the things that we should expect from a cross. Now, I'm going to show you a different picture here. This is a necklace. And what is that? That's an electric chair. If I saw somebody or if my wife bought me a present and said, here, I, I got you a gold electric chair to wear around your neck, that would almost be like gruesome. Like I wouldn't want to wear that in public. It would cause all kinds of questions. And and I, I feel like I'm so near to society because we practice that, you know, um, that's a way to execute criminals in America, the electric chair. It's like a horrible way to die. But it, it represents death, suffering, and pain in a way that you and I understand it because we see that now. That happens in America. The way you feel about that electric chair and those kind of emotions and that kind of fear and that kind of grotesqueness that it provokes, that's how you should feel about the cross. Now, take that feeling about that electric chair and how you kind of want to be distanced from it. Plug that into Jesus's words when he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That's what you should feel. That's how you should think of the cross. Take up your cross every day. The point here is that if you were going to die a gruesome death, it would happen one time. It wouldn't happen every day. So I don't think in all cases, Jesus here is trying to say that you need to be dead every day being crucified. That's, that's not his point. I think he's saying you must be willing to put your neck on the line for God's will over your will every day. I want you to sacrifice your life for me in that sense daily, over and over and over again. That's hard because I feel like I did the will of God yesterday maybe, and today I want a little bit of a break. God is not asking for us to take a break. Jesus didn't take a break, right? I want you to notice in verse 23, it leads into three statements in verses 24, 25, and 26 that start with the word for. Now, when you're reading the text, really any text, the word for symbolizes that because of what was said before it, this is also true after all. So, Take up your cross daily and follow me. Why? Because whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, not taking up your cross daily, not denying yourself, and following Jesus superficially leads to death. It doesn't lead to life. It leads to losing your life. But Jesus doesn't leave us hanging there. He says, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. 
Okay. So losing your life for Jesus doesn't always involve ceasing to exist or, or maybe even dying because whoever will lose his life for Jesus's sake will save it. You will have your life. You will have what God intended for human life and human flourishing as it existed in the Garden of Eden. Everything God intended will be fulfilled in you. Some of it in this life, some of it in the next life. Okay. And why is that true? Verse 25, for, or as a result of, or because, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own self, forfeit his soul? Jesus is saying to give up or to gain this world is to give up your soul. To take the replacement that cannot replace God in all of its substance, the system of the world, which promises you and I so much, the abuse of alcohol, of drugs, the abuse of our time, sexual abuse, taking those things that were maybe good and using them in wrong ways, right? That is the system of the world. Saying God is not my source, but my money is my source. Saying God doesn't keep me alive, I keep me alive. My pills keep me alive. My workout plan keeps me alive. My food uh, that I eat, that keeps me alive. Putting anything before God as your true source, that is the system of the world. Self-preservation, because nobody else will look out for you except you. That's anti-gospel. That's not what Jesus's life is all about. That's not what the Christian life is all about. That is not what abiding in Christ is all about. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed of when he comes in his glory and the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. Here's what I want to stress right here. Jesus is saying to follow him superficially is to be ashamed. It is to say I want to get close enough to Jesus for the entertainment of it all. He's entertaining. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's got a lot of teachings that are kind of interesting to listen to, but I don't actually want to do those things. I don't actually want to follow him. I don't actually want to commit my life to him. That's the problem. And that in Jesus's mind is being ashamed of him. I don't want to involve myself with Jesus like that. When a person gets saved, it's because they realize they're so broken and so need of a savior who can save them from hell, from the eternal judgment and all the other things in life. They throw themselves at Jesus's feet in desperation. That's salvation. I believe in you because without you, I can't make it. I can't save myself from the judgment. I'm too guilty. Even the littlest bit of my guilt is complete guilt before God. But your blood, Jesus, on the cross saves me from that. And I believe your word. I trust your father. I trust you. I trust the spirit. I know that you won't lie to me. I'm all in. Now, if you're all in like that, that doesn't mean that what we're talking about here about denying yourself daily, taking up your cross daily is easy, but it means you're willing to do it and you're willing to go through that process all life long because you know that Jesus will be with you doing it in the process. If you deny Jesus, if you're ashamed of Jesus in front of man, like Peter was, he says, you're done. You're toast. It's over. I'll be ashamed of you in that day. But I want to encourage us that while we struggle to find the will of God for our lives and we're fighting and failing, if we're honest as Christians, we know that we're getting it right in some ways and we're failing in other ways. And yet there's probably some ways in which we sin that we don't even realize it. If we're honest, Jesus walks with us through this. Peter denies Jesus three times after saying, I won't deny you. Even if all these other disciples here, even if they deny you, he put himself above all of them. I will not deny you. He says, I've got it in me to hold on. And so he put himself in a special category against his brothers. And Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times just to make sure that you're sure that you're going to deny me. You're going to know it. You're going to feel it in your soul. And when Jesus was arrested, Peter three times denied Jesus. 
he distanced himself from the Lord. He didn't want anything to do with him. He didn't want to associate with that shame of a, a savior <clears throat> not being king, but being killed and arrested and beaten down. He couldn't put it together, but it was a real sin. It was really denying Jesus. It was really being ashamed of Jesus in front of men. And now he can only expect Jesus to say, then I'll be ashamed of you on the day when you need it most, when you need salvation. But what did Peter find? He goes out in the boat in John, I think chapter 20. And he says he's going fishing. He goes back to his former life. He doesn't know what else to do. He feels like it's over. But what does Jesus do? Jesus pursues Peter. When Peter was not denying himself, but rather he was denying Jesus, we find Jesus pursuing Peter. Peter jumps out of the boat, goes through the water, gets back to the land, not sure what Jesus is going to say. And Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. It's not over for you. I'm restoring you. I'm still saving you. I'm still walking with you. I understand. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to help you. Jesus is willing to walk with us as we stumble and attempt to get it right, taking up the cross daily, suffering for his name, and denying ourselves. So in summary, I just want to encourage you that the call of discipleship costs a lot. It costs you everything. It costs Jesus his life. They say it doesn't cost you anything. Salvation doesn't cost you anything. It costs Jesus everything. But discipleship, following him, that costs you everything. It costs you anything that God says it will cost because you never know what he might require from you or from me. He's giving you everything here ahead of time. It's not like my business process that I told you about where I hope that what the plan I put into motion is, is actually going to produce the result, the cost benefit analysis. If we spend this money, it will get this result. I don't know that that will bring that result. We only hope. Jesus says, this is what it will bring you. If you stand for me, I will stand for you. If you walk with me, I'm walking with you. If you are not ashamed of me, I won't be ashamed of you. When you're struggling, I'm going to bring you back to me. I'm going to walk with you, right? When you're really in, he knows the difference, okay? So he tells us in advance exactly what we're going to get, unlike my business model. We know that we can trust Jesus. He will make good on his promise to save us. And when we turn over our lives to him and we turn over our wills to him, he gets it. He understands where we're at with that. It was a hard decision. And as we struggle to make that choice daily, he's going to walk with us. I want to encourage you. Don't run away from this verse and think, well, I'm so saved. I don't need to worry about discipleship. That's not what this tells us. This tells us that we need to follow him as disciples every day. But I also don't want you to worry about, is my salvation in the balance? Because Paul makes it very clear in Romans 3, 4, 5, that we are saved by grace. It is through faith that we are given Christ's righteousness and forgiveness. We are justified because of him, not because of us. Take that energy of that gospel salvation and get honest with God. Sit down and say, God, where am I not denying myself? Where am I not taking up my cross? How do I need to follow you differently? How do I honor you with my outlook on life? Do I desire the world more than I desire you at times? Sometimes I do. I know that. He will answer that prayer and he will direct you and he will help you. And you will sense his presence as you walk with him and he walks with you throughout your life. He will open his word to you and you will feel him near to you. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.